something of this nation. You're forming a whole body upon which you will breathe afresh a second time. And the word of the Lord will come again a second time to this nation. Well, greetings, everybody, and welcome to a special broadcast of Turnaround Tuesday. We are so excited to make this announcement. We are holding a 50-state solemn assembly this Yom Kippur, Sunday, September 24th, 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. It's a 50-state solemn assembly. Many prayer networks, including the Heartland Apostolic Prayer Network, led by John Benefield, and the Reformation Prayer Network, led by Cindy Jacobs, are going to be involved. Becca Greenwood with SPAN is here. Uh, we'll have Jamie Fitt and our buddy Ed Watts, such a key prophetic word Ed Watts is carrying for Yom Kippur. So it's going to be a very, very exciting time as we see the Lord bring his body corporately together across the nation for prayer, for repentance, to receive a better verdict, a verdict of justice from his shed blood that sets a new course for the United States of America. Honey, what are you feeling about this Yom Kippur? It, I have felt the weight of God in a very unique way this year. It seems like the um, fall feasts are so important. And, and part of what I've felt very strongly is that is that there is a repentance needed by the body of Christ. And that's what Yom Kippur is all about, is a time to set apart for prayer and fasting and allow the conviction of God to come upon us. So I have felt that this year stronger than any other year. And we celebrate the feast every year. And we do the 10 days of awe and we pray through and we want a better verdict from the Lord. But there is weight on this year far greater than any other year I felt in the spirit. Please join us and know that we've cleansed our heart and we've cleansed our lives during this season so that the Lord can get exactly what he wants from the body of Christ. Yeah, God wants to redeem America. He wants to redeem our nation. That's why we're calling it the Solemn Assembly. We're calling it Redeem America. And we want you to share this with all of your friends. It's a time to gather. You know, um, the scripture says, Joel chapter 2 says, Blow the trumpet in Zion. Sound the alarm on my holy mountain. Pro pro proclaim a solemn assembly. Call a fast and proclaim a solemn assembly. And, you know, just this year has been an orchestration by the Lord that has gone line by line and precept by precept where God literally gave us a shofar to sound, to sound the alarm. And he then summoned us in a very, very unusual way <laughs> to uh, proclaim a solemn assembly. And the way that we received this calling, I wish it came from a dream uh, or an angelic visitation. We did have a visitation from the angel of the Lord, but it came through a text from James Nesbitt, who mentioned an 89-year-old intercessor named Shirley Crowell. 
and uh, Shirley had texted James to text us. Uh, here's James's text. Blessings, John and Jolene, an 89-year-old intercessor, Shirley Crowell from Missouri, whom I've known for a long, long time and who follows you, asked me to contact you. She strongly believes that there needs to be a nationwide sol solemn assembly in every state on Yom Kippur, relaying the message from a tenacious bloodhound <laughs> intercessor, blessings, it's in your court now. And baby, you know, that just stopped me in my tracks. It's in your court now. Mm. According to Hebraic theology, Yom Kippur marks a culmination point for today's law, where, where heaven's court is open for you and I to cleanse our lives, repent before the Lord, and petition him to grant us a better verdict than we deserve. According to Hebraic theology, Jewish theology, the Lord writes down in a scroll uh, his verdict for our lives. Every individual, every state, every nation, God writes in his book, the verdict, his book of life, he writes the verdict for our lives for this year. And between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, the courts are open for us to petition him for a better verdict. According to Hebraic theology, at the close of Yom Kippur, when that trumpet sounds a final time, heaven's court is shut and the verdict is sealed. And it's just like Jesus. Jesus is always giving us a better outcome. His mercy is great. He never holds to our account. He wipes with the blood, his very own blood. He wipes the account and every sin that we've done out of the books. And we just thank the Lord, but it is our job to repent of it and to get clean and, and allow him to do the work he needs to do. Jesus' mercy is unbelievable. And this is the season, just like every other season, where we're going to concentrate on repenting and fasting and allowing the Lord to give us better than all of us deserve. So, you know, um, that reminds me of a key scripture that basically shares God's heart in the midst of a time where judgment is breaking out. Second Chronicles 7, verse 14, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sins and I will for heal their land. That's what we need for America. We we're going to share in just a moment some key prophetic warnings that have been coming across our heart and uh, coming across our, our uh, awareness uh, from other prophets as well. But we know that there's something going on as of this fall that is potentially even an existential threat for the United States of America and maybe even for Israel. We don't know what it is in fullness. Nobody does, but we feel it. So you know, when we went to Israel the last time, uh, we actually went on to the Temple Mount and we had very key prayer assignments that we we're f concentrating on fulfilling. When the Lord redirected our attention back to the sacredness of that mountain and the importance of the promise that he made on this mountain, he actually called us to redig the well of Second Chronicles 7, 14, a promise made on that very mountain to Solomon to broadcast generationally to the people of God through every generation. And uh, it was an amazing moment, wasn't it? It totally was. Um, Second Chronicles 7, 14 is something that many in the body of Christ have been focused on. And, and the most important part of that is to seek the Lord and, and to repent of our sins and allow him to do what it is he wants to do, which is heal our land. He wants to heal us and he wants to heal our land. It's so vitally important. 
And check this out. That promise was actually made to Solomon after Solomon prayed uh, and consecrated the house of the Lord, the temple to the Lord. Fire fell, consuming the sacrifice. Fire fell from heaven, confirming that the covenant of God was uh, established. But fire fell actually on the very altar that David had erected. Solomon built the temple around the altar that David erected a generation before when God was about to slay all Jerusalem for David's sin. And the angel of the Lord was hovering over the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite on what is now the Temple Mount. And all Jerusalem saw the angel hovering, sword outstretched, ready to release a plague that would decimate all of Jerusalem. And David cried out, he said, listen, let your hand be upon me and my father's house. But these sheep, what have they done? They haven't done anything. Have mercy. He took responsibility for his own sin as the governmental leader of the, of the United States of America, governmental leader of the United States of Israel. How about that? He took responsibility for his sin and he cried out and God responded by saying, go build an altar up there. And isn't that exactly what we want in our lives? We want our children to build, to build around the altar. It's a generational altar. We on Turnaround Tuesday desire for our children to build a foundation around an altar we've laid for them. Yes. And that's exactly what Turnaround Tuesday is all about. We are fasting and praying and building an altar so that our children can build a foundation and build a temple around what we've generationally laid for them. That is our prayer in Turnaround Tuesday. That's our prayer for the Lamplighter family. That's our prayer for the body of Christ and the nation. Let's generationally build together. That's so, so good, sweetheart. And, and just as David built the altar, Solomon built the temple around the altar. The promise endures. The promise endures to all generation. I love the uh, promise of covenant. It says, this covenant I have made with you, you shall not forget, nor shall you fear other gods, but the Lord your God you shall fear, and he shall deliver you from the hand of every adversary. That's Second Kings 17, 38, and 39. And uh, the book of Isaiah says this, This is my covenant with them, says the Lord, my spirit which is on you and my words which I have placed in your mouth shall not depart out of your mouth, nor out of the mouth of your offspring or your offspring's offspring, says the Lord from now and forever. We are wanting to see a generational altar built that our sons and daughters can establish their own homes on as well as a dwelling place for the people of God in their region, uh, a breakthrough in the heavenly realms, awakening and revival. In fact, honey, I really believe that as we partner with the Lord, we can see awakening and revival come even in this season. I know that there are many warnings that uh, America is going to come to a standstill, and uh, we are not unaware of that. We agree but we can also see God bring a turnaround. He did it in David's day. The angel of the Lord that was about to slay Jerusalem put the sword back in his sheath and mercy was released instead of judgment at the very threshold where the people were about to be decimated. And, you know, just as Israel has its temple mount, we kind of have our threshing floor too that can become a place of mercy where mercy is decreed. And it's a threshing floor moment for us. We're all being shaken, right? Now is our time to cry out for God's mercy in all 50 states together as one, from Alaska and Hawaii to the East Coast, every state in between, a united altar crying out to the Lord for mercy, for God to restrain and rebuke the devouring forces that are set to 
take us out to disempower our freedom. And I believe as we join together, it's going to set a, a, a new course for what's ahead. And Second Chronicles 7, 14 is a good example of what the Holy Spirit spoke to us about earlier this summer, that the Hebrew year 5784, which begins on Rosh Hashanah, is a year of redemptive transactions where our redemptive transactions with the Lord can overcome cycles of sinful transactions that have even uh, set a course for judgment generationally. It's an if-then statement. If my people do this, if they humble themselves and pray and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. It's an if-then statement. It's a redemptive transaction. And we want to encourage you to engage with us fully in this. Get the word out. Tell your communities across your social networks. Share this with your church, with your ministry. Get the word out. We want to gather together all 50 states. The, it's amazing to see the prayer networks and the response from the leaders of prayer networks uh, that, that this is desperately needed at this time, and we're all joining together. So the body of Christ corporately is already joining together. We want you to join with us for this extraordinary time. Now, sweetheart, I want to shift uh, our focus a little bit. So to make a very important point, Jolene and I just uh, made a journey outside of Washington, D.C. to Bull Run. It's otherwise known as the First Battle of Manassas. I guess the Confederates call it the First Battle of Manassas and the Union folks called it Bull Run. Well, the point I want to make is we are at a pivot point right now as a nation of a magnitude that is hauntingly similar to the American Revolution. You could say the computer revolution, the Jesus revolution, but also the Civil War. And uh, it's really interesting how Washington, D.C. responded to the threat of civil war. Here's what they did. Uh, they heard that the battle was going to be taking place. The first battle of the Civil War was Bull Run. They heard this battle was going to be taking place out in uh, the Manassas area. And so many Washingtonians actually packed up their bags and decided to come out to Manassas for a picnic to watch as spectators the first battle of the Civil War. Imagine being a spectator at the first battle of the Civil War, expecting a tailgate party. You know, we are in dire need of discernment. Yeah, Washington, D.C. is in dire need of discerning the times. Here's an important point I want to make for you. Those who do not discern the times are going to face the consequences but those who discern the times will be given grace by God even to define the times. That's what we need right now, and I really hope that is you. You know, as we have shared, those who discern the times can go on to define the times. Those who do not discern the times they will succumb to the times. They will become prey to the times. But those who discern the times will be graced by God to define the times. So let's talk for a little bit about some of the challenges that we have prophetically received. And I want to start off by saying, as we talk about what many would call coming storms, we have had many words about coming storms. We want to emphasize that storms can turn. We're actually going to go to Tampa, Florida to join with Jen Mallon because Tampa, Florida last year at this time was facing the wrath of Hurricane Ian. Hurricane Ian was making a, a, a direct hit on Tampa. That's what the weather forecasters projected. And yet it turned. And then this year, uh, 
the hurricane that came this year was heading directly for Tampa. And once again, it turned. So I believe, you know, with both uh, hurricane, uh, um, yeah, with hurricane Ian and hurricane Idilla, I think that's how you call it, say it. They both turned as God's people prayed. <clears throat> it's interesting because, because both all the storms and I've even read articles about storms that are, are named with Ian Adelia, it's I storms, wow. the eye of the storm. Mm. And the Lord's been talking to me about I, 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 people who are self-focused, people who are only focused on one thing. The eye of the storm is not only the eye of the storm, but the I, the capital I of the storm. And the hardest storms that are hitting the nation at this time is people who feel entitled, people who feel like it's all about them. We've all lost a respect. I'm always amazed, even driving, even going about in my daily day, how much people have lost the ability to be kind and loving and gentle with each other. To me, the storms that are hitting America are all eye storms. It's all about me. It's all about me. The eye of the storm is the big eye in the storm. And we have to begin to uh, do the fruits of the spirit. The fruits of the spirit are kindness and gentleness and love. And we have to get back to portraying that, but also pulling out the entitlement that's in the spirit right now, the entitlement over our children, the entitlement over the church, the entitlement over the political parties. There's all the entitlement that's going on because the big eye in the storm is when it's all about me. Lord, let's pull the eye out of the storm and let's make it a corporate. That's what I love about this solemn assembly is it's corporate. It's all of us coming together to humble ourselves and repent. The Lord spoke to me the other night. We were in a meeting that was so amazing. We were with friends of ours in a small little meeting in D.C. And the presence of God and the fear of God was very, very tangible. And there was a point where it felt like heaven opened and the minister was talking about a portal that had just opened in the room and I felt it. And when that portal opened, I heard the Lord say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Mm -hmm. And he pointed out two things to me. One is we are in a season of repentance, but the most important part of what he was saying and what he emphasized, yes, he emphasized repent, but the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus is about to come. Holy Spirit is about to come. Father God is about to come. He is at hand. He is right around the corner. Our repentance is going to invite him in in a stronger way. I was so excited coming out of that meeting. We actually asked the people ministering to pray deeper into the fear of the Lord coming. Pray deeper into the ability of, of us to feel the conviction of God and cleanse everything out of our lives. The truth is the more we cleanse our hearts and cleanse our spirits, the greater that the Lord can come in and inhabit our lives. And the big eye needs to, will begin to go and people will return to kindness and gentleness, repentance, will bring the love of Jesus on the earth. Isn't that what we all want in our lives? Isn't that what we all want in our families? We want to love deeply because that is the Lord's heart. Let's get rid of the eye of the storm in Jesus' name. That's so powerful, sweetheart. What a revelation. And what an important revelation for here in Washington, D.C., where the eye of the storm 
<clears throat> excuse me, the eye of the storm has caused literally major hurricanes, major disruptions, major divisions, even in our nation, where politicians have uh, uh, recognized that the divisive nature of uh, the political world right now uh, is easier to raise funds off of and project and promote themselves by than actually casting vision for a united America. And, you know, we're playing with fire here. We were out at Bull Run uh, and, and uh, were stunned by what we saw and felt in the spirit because, you know, with Bull Run once again, as we shared earlier, uh, that was the first battle of the Civil War. And at that time, you know, it was debatable whether America would really go to war or not. And so this first battle of Bull Run down in Manassas, it was kind of like uh, almost a, a fantasy football game, if you will, a flag football game. Washingtonians actually came out to uh, watch the, the, the war as a spectator. They came out to watch the battle on the sidelines and actually bring their kids and have a picnic and have a good time. You know, I mean, it's just staggering. Even uh, major governmental leaders came out for this and as almost like it was a spectator sport with the tailgate party, right? And they had no idea that they were playing with literal fire and our nation would erupt into a civil war of a magnitude that was unprecedented in its day. It brought out eventually the best of all Americans. Yeah, and when we were at, at Bull Run, I was just walking across the field and I was walking and praying and literally praying in the spirit. And I heard the Lord say, there is going to be a second battle of Bull Run. And the enemy, Baal, is about to make another run against this country. So we, I just declared right then and there that the enemy would get defeated before he decides to make another mm -hmm. run at America. There will not be a second battle at Bull Run, he will not get the opportunity. And I thank you for the angelic forces that you are sending against him. I thank you that you are sending prayer warriors. I thank you that you gave us the ability to walk on that land and declare this far and no more, there will not be another run at America by the principality of Baal. We declare that now in the name of Jesus. Amen. That's so powerful. You know, Baal is kind of the principality of uh, supernatural divisiveness and division. And chaos. Yeah. Jezebel served Baal. Just saying. <laughs> and just to, in that analogy, um, a bull always represents Baal. Right. I mean, the Lord was using a double entendre there where he was showing a bull and Baal equal each other and that it was an amazing thing to hear as I walked across that field. You know, division is something that we've contended with in, in an amazing way across this nation um, and it has really, really affected uh, our politics. You know, disinformation that divides has been used as a catalyst to empower uh, certain parties and certain politicians. And as soon as they get into office, all that stuff just suddenly goes away. It's, it's pretty extraordinary, but the challenges don't go away. We as the body of Christ are called to be a unifying force for this nation in a time where the enemy would try to bring great division. Both Israel and America are suffering from judicial, uh, division that has largely been empowered by political foes, political rivals. And these political rivals have gone even so far as to weaponize different departments within government, even the judicial system, weaponized to bring up one particular party in power at the expense of others. You know what? That's not how our nation was designed by our forefathers to function. We are not a dictatorship. No king but Jesus means that this government is for him and in him it is for we the people. And we are no longer going to tolerate 
the reprehensible woke ideologies that have imperiled our children, the lies and disinformation that have been thrust upon us. We take that mantle off and we wear the mantle of Jesus Christ alone. This is something major. We're setting a new course, even for 5784. Uh, it, it's going to be an amazing time, 2024. I believe we're even going to set a, a, a course that will be, uh, it's the beginning of a journey for 14 months through the entire election process as we see a, a, a new foundation laid and a new breakthrough made that, that forges a better pathway that secures our freedom for generations to come. Now, I want to talk also about some of the threats that are paramount before us as we move into 9-11. And of course, uh, Yom Kippur is just days away from 9-11. Um, but many people have been sensing 9-11. In fact, our friend Lenny Harlow had a very, very strong word. A few days ago, Lenny awoke to a sobering warning. The Holy Spirit spoke to her that an event is being planned by the enemy that is of a magnitude greater even than September 11th. It's hard to believe that 22 years have gone by since the Pentagon and the World Trade Center were struck by pl planes that were taken over by terrorists turned into weapons of mass destruction. We still live with the trauma of that today. And uh, it's appropriate to pay homage it's appropriate to remember. As I look at the pictures of the Pentagon, most people don't realize that the Pentagon was actually struck at the Western Wall. So the Western Wall of the Pentagon was a place where the plane penetrated. You know, America has a Western Wall just like Israel has a Western Wall. And uh, it is sacred ground. It's holy ground. In fact, on the inside of the Western Wall, there is now a 9-11 chapel, the very place where the Pentagon was struck. For the past two prayer journeys, revival journeys, prayer tours that we have taken uh, in 2022 and now in 2023, uh, they were both spontaneously commissioned out of that 9-11 chapel by precious friends, two separate friends who work at the Pentagon, strong believers, and they both uh, wanted to uh, pray and commission us from that 9-11 chapel. There's a reason for that. God's trumpet is sounding a warning word right now. He wants us to cry out for help, to call 911 and ask him to restrain and expose what the enemy is trying to do before it's too late. Both Israel and America, our enemies are seeing it. They're looking and they're saying, you know, they're at their greatest point of vulnerability that they've been in a long time historically, and maybe they're at their most vulnerable point that they will be for some time in the future. I mean, you know, uh, our enemies are literally poised to strike. You look at Iran and the threats from Iran, Russia and China hearing that an event bigger than 9-11, a terrorist strike bigger than 9-11, is being planned for this fall. You know, that stunned me because I myself had received many prophetic words about 9-11, 9-11 warnings that we need to call 911. That's one of the major aspects of our Yom Kippur gathering. We're going to call 911. We're going to cry out to the Lord for help, right? And, uh, what the Lord is really showing us is that these challenges that the enemy would try to bring our way can be mitigated. The storms can turn. It's very important to understand that. But in this regard, one of the most important warnings that we personally have received is regarding cyber warfare and even the potential of widespread power outages as our, our electrical grid comes under attack. We have to pray against this. It could be really devastating for our nation. The rate th This really kind of 
came to the forefront for us, our, our power went off in Pentagon City, which never happens. And, you know, apparently it was caused by an accident, but the entire power grid went down. I mean, Amazon's right across the street. You got the Pentagon, you got Crystal City, you got, you know, Reagan National Airport. I don't know how many of these institutions went out. Most of them went to generators, of course. But the very fact that there was a power outage stirred us to see and we began to pray and the Lord was giving a warning very clearly about attacks through AI, cyber warfare, even potentially a nuclear challenge against our power grid. And the Lord yeah, many years ago, probably two or three years ago, we'd already had discussed this and many are talking about uh, the plagues from Exodus coming back. And the Lord had spoken to me about one of the most important plagues that I felt was coming upon America was the three days of darkness. The 11th plague was the three days of darkness. And it was right before the Lord came and the Passover and people put blood on the door and people, um, the Lord caused uh, the three days of darkness came and then the Lord caused the Passover blood to save many as a spirit of death had come over the land. And we're just declaring during this time that that plague of three days of darkness, it doesn't need to come. If we repent and do what it is we need to do, we just declare in the name of Jesus, three days of darkness, which I don't know whether it's a cyber attack. I don't know whether it's the power grid going down, but we are very close to many things like that happening in, to, in America, and we need to turn them with our repentance. We need to take these warnings seriously. So, in you know, just in case you're like, oh, you know, we'll, people always say something bad's going to happen like this and it never happens. What if I told you that there'd be a uh, devastating strike, a war that would kill 100,000 people, primarily children, in one year in the United States of America? That's extraordinarily seriously. That's more than uh, uh, the, the people who died, the Americans who died in Vietnam over a decade, in one year, 100 thousand people. What if I told you that? What if I gave that prophecy? Well, that's already happening. In one year alone, a hundred thousand people died due to fentanyl. And fentanyl is a drug that is largely created by labs in China. It's smuggled across our southern border especially, and it targets, the marketing targets our children. Our children are being targeted. This is happening right now. We need to cry out for our sons and daughters. We need to see victory in this war that is targeting our next generation to take our next generation down. We need mercy from God. We need the spirit and power of Elijah turning the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers and all of our hearts back to him and back to his ways. That's how our nation was founded and that's how our nation is going to enter into the covenant blessings that we've all dreamed of that we see slipping away from us even right now. And the most the thing that concerns me the most even as I go to prayer is that we can mitigate things but it feels like some of the things that are about to come are imminent. It feels like we are in a season where the cup of iniquity is full where many things are to the place where God in his mercy will always correct us. He corrects us in a loving and gentle way, but his, his corrections are um, progressive. Right. As we don't correct, as we don't um, change, as we don't repent and turn and go the other way, the scripture says you need fruit fruit that is a um, variant or showing your repentance, your repentance.
repentance must be borne out with fruit. And when that fruit is not there, the, the judgments of God get progressive. When you look at the plagues that happened in Exodus, the judgments got progressive. And so many people are to the point of stubbornly putting their heels in and the Lord is progressing. So uh, it has been my largest concern as I pray that many of the things that we're warning about, we can mitigate, but I don't think we can turn them. I think the nation is at a place where the, where the Lord is going to come repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. God is right at hand and the repentance is what we need to do to mitigate and hopefully turn circumstances. But I believe we're at the place of mitigating right now because the cup seems to be full. But you know, in, in the midst of that, sweetheart, uh, I, I totally agree. It is his mercy to sound the alarm. It is his mercy. And um, I believe he does want to give America another chance. He wants to give the body of Christ another chance where we have succumbed to divisiveness and, and where we have not uh, come together in him. You, the encouraging thing I see is that it, despite the challenges and the rhetoric, so many in the body of Christ are genuinely coming together. We are rising up as one, one people made out of every tongue, tribe and nation, the shofar sounds, and we are gathering together as one. And it's not about political ideology. We, we saw how far that went. That, that, that did not save us one way or the other, right? We need Jesus to save our nation. We need Jesus to break us through into the new season where we're made strong by what every joint supplies. Yeah, the most amazing thing is the nation is we the people, but it's time for the body of Christ to be we the people. This comes back to the analogy about the eye of the storm. We need to change the eye to we, and we need to become we Come the on, people prophesy. in the body of Christ. We the people in the body of Christ will have the answer collectively as we allow the angels to operate, as we allow God and invite him in. We just declare we the people is the answer. And with that, we just want to thank you for joining us for an amazing, amazing broadcast. Please get this out to your friends. Please share with your brothers and your sisters. Uh, we're, we're wanting to have a we the people moment before the throne of God, because once again, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. Amen.